Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome to NYU. My name is Cecil Scheib, and I am a, a Chief Sustainability Officer here at NYU. Um, I'm so glad you're all here. I just wanted to say um, a couple words about NYU and why I think this is so important. So as part of my job at NYU and helping us meet our climate goals and helping engage our community, I do a lot of speaking to students. And actually, fall semester, I made it a goal to speak to as many students as I could. And I went out into classes and I spoke to over 5,000 undergraduate students uh, this fall. NYU is a big place. And I ask students the same couple of questions. I say, who here knows about global climate change? Basically, every hand goes up, right? The kids that are coming to us for college, they know what's coming. They've seen the papers. They've been educated. And then I ask, keep your hand up if you think you can make a difference, that your voice matters. Almost all the hands go down. And I say, raise your hand if you're scared. And all the hands go back up, right? People know this change is coming. It scares them. And they don't feel that they can do anything about it. And what I think is so critical there is that so often fighting climate change, making a difference is viewed as a technical question. It's a question, and you're gonna hear about these things, things tonight, I assume, heat pumps, electric vehicles, all this different technology. But I believe that at the end of the day, it's a social question. It's the story we tell ourselves. We have the technology we need to deal with these problems. It's the choice of whether we use it. It's the, it's the story we tell ourselves about, we know we can make a difference, we can fix this, but will we? And that's why I think it's so important that you all have showed up, taken your time. You could have been doing something else. You came here to talk about what is New York City gonna do to take its, uh, take its part in confronting global climate change and your voice does matter and doing it with the, with the input of the community is how you we will tell our story in a way that sticks so i just want to say briefly what we're doing um, at nyu and how we've worked with the mayor's office we helped the mayor's office set up the first new york city carbon challenge uh, back in the year 2007 that challenged um, universities and hospitals to cut their uh, greenhouse gas emissions 30 percent in 10 years. No one knew if it could be done, but the city said, let's start with universities and hospitals because these are institutions that own their buildings, we're willing to invest in the long term. NYU cut its emissions 30% in just five years. That's the equivalent of planting all of Manhattan and all of, all of Brooklyn in trees. And I use, this, I use this example with students to say, don't think this has to take decades. It doesn't rapid change is possible. We can make that change. We're currently on target for a total of 50% uh, reductions by the year 2025 and to be carbon neutral by the year 2040. How are we gonna do it? Our buildings have to go all electric. You can't be net zero, you can't be zero if you're burning fossil fuels. We need to go electric. And then as the grid greens, and as you'll hear much more tonight, the state has its own goals about green grid, when we get there, we will be truly climate neutral. And I try to tell this story to students. This change is going to happen in such a short period. The year, the year 2040 seems so far away, but the students that will be sitting in these seats at NYU in the year 2040 are already born. We have one short lifetime between someone being born and they coming to this building to study engineering, to study to study something else to, to uh, get this right. So we've always been very pleased to partner with the mayor's office, so happy to host tonight, so happy to see such a great turnout um, on a cold night. I wanna give a particular shout out to the folks in Tandon's Sustainable Engineering Initiative and Andrea, Andrea Silverman in that initiative who has something called FloodNet, which is warning um, uh, for the uh, Gowanus uh, neighborhood that has flood sensors that lets people in the neighborhood know and gives them warning when a flood may happen so that they can be 
uh, be prepared. Because at this point, we have to do more than just mitigation. We have to think about adaptation as well, because this changes here. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Claudia. And I want to say thank you for coming and have a great discussion. Thanks so much, Cecil. And thanks so much to NYU for hosting us. It's really wonderful to be here. It's such a beautiful building. I've never been here before, but it's a great space for this conversation. Um, and thank you so much to all of you for coming out on a Thursday night. I know it's a long event and everyone's cold and tired. So really appreciate you making the effort to be here with us today. Um, so I'm Claudia Vigad Lehman. I'm an energy policy advisor with the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, you may have previously heard of us as the Mayor's Office of Sustainability or the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Um, under this administration, we've now combined to think more holistically about climate planning from an equity perspective. Um, so I, I'm excited to talk a little bit about New York City's goals and our initiatives here with the Power Up Project, and then I'll hand it over um, to our excellent CBO partners who we've been working with, our community-based organization partners who we've been working with to organize uh, these community town halls and other outreach and engagement events to make sure that you as New Yorkers have the opportunity to participate in the energy transition planning process. Um, so I'll just start with a high-level overview. So of course, New York City is committed to carbon neutrality by 2050, and that includes 100% clean electricity by 2040. Um, but we really need to be doing that while focusing on equity and inclusion. So um, that's sort of the new mission of our Climate and Environmental Justice Office. Um, we need to be prioritizing air quality improvements, particularly in communities um, that have the most impacts on health and air quality, poor air quality outcomes. Um, and we need to be thinking about democratizing energy information. It is very difficult for an average New Yorker to participate in energy planning, even if they care about climate change, even if they care about clean energy, um, just because those planning processes aren't always transparent and they aren't always easy to access because they're so filled with jargon. So that's part of the goal of tonight is to really um, try to put some of these concepts into plain language and invite you all to comment and give us feedback on what your energy priorities are. Um, so that way we can incorporate them into the planning process. Um, affordability is a huge issue in New York City. So uh, one and a half million New York City residents are energy cost burdened, which means they're paying too much of their income on energy bills. And so as we transition and make all of these new investments in clean energy, we need to be thinking about how to direct the benefits and the savings that can be associated with that towards those who need it most. So that way people can afford to pay their energy bills in New York City. Um, and of course, we need to be doing this while thinking about resiliency, so reliability, making sure that people um, don't have to deal with outages, even as we're transitioning to clean power and even as the impacts of climate change are intensifying. So we're really um, in this unified office trying to think about and address all of these problems holistically as we embark on this uh, energy planning process. Um, so environmental justice and climate justice are part of our office's name. So I just wanted to spend a moment talking about what that actually means. Um, we wanna make sure that we're ensuring access and inclusion in planning and decision-making like we're uh, uh, hoping to try to start tonight. Um, and we need to really be focusing on the disparities in environmental health and quality of life, life outcomes um, between different New York City neighborhoods and really prioritize frontline communities. Um, climate justice, of course, uh, very similar themes, but really focused on communities that are most vulnerable to a rapidly changing climate. Um, climate change often exacerbates social inequities that already existed, um, and that was really made clear by every disaster that's hit the headlines in the last couple of years. Um, I personally was most impacted in my career trajectory by Hurricane Maria when that hit Puerto Rico in 2017, where a lot of my family is from. Of course, many of you know, devastated the island with 3, 000, over 3,000 dead and people without power for 11 months um, or, or sometimes longer. And that's really one example of um, systems where that are already sort of broken, really impacting people who are already marginalized from the planning process. And Energy, I think, is a really exciting space where you can both address uh, reducing emissions and helping to reduce the impacts of climate change in the future, while also building resiliency to the impacts that are already baked in. 
Um, so I just wanted to provide a little context that will sort of frame the rest of the night's discussion, which are the general pillars of the energy transition that are pretty widely accepted. Um, the first is to use less energy. So if we want to achieve our clean energy transition, we need to move forward quickly on energy efficiency measures. So that could be something as simple as what you see Green City Force doing here, delivering high efficiency light bulbs to tenants in the Bronx. It could be more costly and complicated weatherization processes like roof replacements or uh, upgrading the facade, the outside of a building. Um, after we've done our energy efficiency, we need to be switching to electricity wherever possible. Um, so that could be like switching from a bus that uses diesel to one that uses electricity, such as you see here in this, in this image. We also need to be electrifying our buildings. So right now in New York City, most buildings get their heat from burning uh, natural gas or fuel oil in the, in the basement, and we need to be switching over to electric systems instead wherever feasible. And then finally, if we're electrifying everything, we need to make sure that that uh, electricity is actually generated from clean sources. Um, so we're, uh, you know, part of a broader New York State plan to achieve 70% renewables by 2030, 100% clean electricity by 2040, and we're excited to explore opportunities for the city to uh, help make that transition possible. Um, I did want to just take a moment to pause uh, to recognize the enormity of the challenge when it comes to climate risk and incorporating the impacts of climate change in our uh, energy planning. So by the 2050s, we are expecting a significant increase in storm intensity, as well as days with extreme rain um, that, you know, have clear impacts on the way that our energy system will be built. We're also expecting nearly two feet of sea level rise. Um, and by the 2050s, up to quadruple the number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So that'll basically mean that our summers in New York feel more like Birmingham, Alabama summers than a New York City of the past. So it's a pretty uh, extreme challenge. And um, I think it's just uh, another, um, another way to emphasize how important it is to be thinking holistically about our energy planning challenges. Um, so what is Power Up NYC? That's the name on the flyers that hopefully brought you here tonight. Uh, Power Up is an inclusive energy transition plan led by the New York City Mayor's Office, and it's sort of got two main buckets in, in the process. The first is why we're here today. We want to be championing and prioritizing and understanding New Yorkers' priorities when it comes to the energy transition. Um, so we've been doing a lot of community outreach and, and listening opportunities to better understand what you guys would like to see in the future. And then the second part is research oriented. So we have done a lot of work both at the city and the state to understand what is going to be needed for the energy transition. So we wanted to be very conscious as we were planning power up to not reinvent the wheel. We really wanted to build off of what we already understand and then identify specific gaps where research has not yet been conducted that um, where answers would really be helpful in understanding what the next steps of city government action should be to help catalyze this transition. Um, so you'll hear more about those specific research areas in just a few minutes. And then where are we headed? So the end goal is that we're going to publish uh, a plan, an energy plan next April for Earth Day. Um, and that will really identify specific actions that New York City government can take um, to move forward this equitable energy transition citywide. Um, that being said, this is the first of a long process. So we are required by law to put out this energy plan every four years, which is a good thing because this is going to be a very iterative process. And what we need um, in the next four years is going to be very different than what we need in the next eight or 12 years. Um, so after this process, after this plan is published, it's not the end of all planning, but it will be an opportunity to uh, try to implement the strategies that are outlined in the plan, assess our progress, and then repeat an analysis um, in the years going forward. So it's really a long haul commitment. So hope you're, hope you're in it with us. Um, and with that, I'm really excited to introduce our community-based organization partners. So like I mentioned, we've been working with five different community-based organizations since the beginning of this project, um, one from each borough, and they've really helped us connect with communities on the ground, given us feedback on all of our outreach materials, and asked really um, poignant questions about the way that we were uh, shaping our research. So really, really excited. Um, lot, huge shout out to helping us plan this town hall as well, and I'll be happy to invite the CBO partners to come up briefly to introduce yourselves 
and share a little bit about your organization and your role in the project. Um, so I guess, can you please join me in welcoming the CBO partners? And I can hand it off first to Leslie Vasquez of South Bronx Unite. Hi, everybody. My name is Leslie Vasquez, and I am the Clean Air Program Coordinator at South Bronx Unite. And South Bronx Unite is an organization that serves the Mott Haven and Port Morris communities of the South Bronx. And in those two communities, there are 60,000 residents and one small park available to them. That means that uh, we do not have accessibility to green space and we have a lot of injustices that come out uh, because of that. We have three major highways our coast is dotted with polluting facilities, four power peak plants, the list goes on. We have uh, the Bronx Waste Management directed all to our area. So we experience a lot of truck traffic, a lot of air pollution, and we struggle with air quality. Our residents um, suffer with one of the highest asthma rates in the whole country. And so South Bronx Unite wants to transition the South Bronx into a more electrified um, borough so that our communities can thrive. Uh, we have been uh, piled up with continuous injustices that detriment the, the success of our communities, health-wise, economic-wise, social-wise. And so with Power Up New York City and with this study, we hope to electrify the borough so that we can uh, become uh, more environmentally sustainable and health and improve the health of our communities. I will pass it over to Chaya from CDC. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, my name is Jessica Balgobin. I am from Chaya CDC, which is a Queens-based nonprofit established to address the housing and economic needs for low-income South Asian and Indo-Caribbean New Yorkers. So at Chaya, we provide direct services that meet critical needs within our communities, um, as well as organize and advocate uh, for systematic change that remove barriers to well-being, um, housing stability, and economic mobility for our communities. Our participation in this initiative um, is based in our belief in environmental justice for communities of color like those that we serve. We see the need for envi environmental justice in communities like Richmond Hill and South Ozone Park, where I'm from, in Queens, where major highways like the Van Wyck Expressway cut through neighborhoods, leaving behind a harmful amount of gas emissions, more so than in any other neighborhood. We see the need for the rising cost of fossil, sorry, we see the need with the rising cost of fossil fuels, causing the homeowners that we work with to struggle to pay for heat. Our communities also are directly faced with consequences of climate change. During Hurricane Ida in 2021, many of our community members in Queens experienced irreparable damages to their homes and some lost their lives. The health and economic well-being of our communities are directly tied to the environment around us. We do not want important decisions to be made for us. Rather, we firmly believe in the power of community and will continue to fight for our community's voices to be heard. Um, I'll pass it to you. Thank you. This is a town hall about energy. And I'll admit my energy on this Thursday evening at 6 p.m. is waning. We've heard a lot of fantastic introductions. And so I'm actually gonna ask us all to take a quick stand up. And I want you to just stretch, stretch. Let's do whatever you want. This is your space. We're gonna be sitting here for two hours. Stretch, talk to your neighbor, say who you are what your interest is in being here tonight. Okay, and when you're ready, you can take your seat. <laughs> I have the power. Um, and I want to point out, we have lovely Spanish interpreters with us tonight. And so for our Spanish speakers in the room, I want us to be mindful of the speed in which we're speaking tonight so that they can best help others understand um, everything that we are saying. So um, thank you everyone. And so I will now tell you who I am, who has been directing you right now. Um, so I am our state policy manager with WEACT for environmental justice. And who is WEACT? 
We Act has been fighting environmental racism at the city, state, and federal levels for more than 30 years. We are a community-based organization that's been building healthy communities by ensuring people of color and low-income communities participate meaningfully. Part of this town hall tonight is in the goal of that process and participate in the creation of fair environmental health policies and practices. Uh, we act works toward achieving energy democracy across New York State um, because we believe energy is a human right and we're fighting to make it one through a number of campaigns. Energy should be a human right because we use it in our daily lives. We use it to cook, we use it to work, we use it. Some people have at home medical devices that they need stable access to energy to use. And in our community of Northern Manhattan, we act has witnessed families spending too much income on the utility bills. We've seen people um, in debt ranging from $500 to $5,000. And this debt crisis we're seeing severely impacts our community's ability to put food on the table and to pay their rent. Buildings in New York City, you'll hear more tonight, but they're responsible for 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. 70%, that's crazy, y'all. Um, and greenhouse gas emissions are terrible for the planet and for you because they contribute to our changing climate, which low-income communities and communities of color have the least resources available to adapt to. So this is why it's so important we focus on buildings today and also why we want to see energy efficiency part of the stress transition. First of all, thank you so much. Thank you for that grounding. I do think it's important to recognize. Um, yes, we are here on a cold, bleak, like winter night. It's a Thursday night. It's we, you know, got slow to, to, to get started. So I appreciate all that everyone who is here and also I think recognizing like our goals and how uh, we can continue to um, better ourselves and ameliorate and thinking who, who is in here and how we can continue to expand and be expansive and inclusive in these processes, which is part of the overarching goal. Um, but thank you for that grounding. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Dani Castillo. I am the program manager for the Greenlight District um, at El Puente. Um, and I do have something written because off. Um, but just to introduce um, El Puente, uh, we are a community human rights institution. We promote leadership uh, for peace and justice through the engagement of our members, both youth and adult members, in um, an intersectional holistic approach of merging the arts, education, scientific research, wellness, and environmental action. We're building upon a legacy of fighting environmental injustices in the south side of Williamsburg and have since then expanded. Um, we were founded in 1982. We uh, integrate this, these diverse activities and community campaigns through the arts, through our Green Light District Initiative, which is a holistic community de uh, development um, initiative, thinking about um, how we think about community development, not just in and resiliency and sustainability, not just in, in regards to the climate crisis and the current um, climate crisis that we're within and climate change, but how we think about our communities um, in thriving ways, holistically, um, and what that means. The Greenlight District has um, five main areas that we're always looking at intersectionally, um, affordable living, health and wellness, arts and culture, um, environmental justice and education. And um, we also have a Global Justice Training Institute um, within um, our youth leadership centers. We have a public high school, the El Puente Academy for Peace and Justice, building upon a legacy of uh, self-determination, of reclaiming, um, you know, um, education that uh, is culturally resonant and, um, and radical. And also the El Puente MS50 Community School uh, in North Brooklyn. And we also have the uh, Latino Climate Action Network in Puerto Rico. Um, so we continue to attempt to remain at the forefront of community-led movements for self-determination and uh, initiate an impact social policy, both locally and nationally. So to bring it back to this like intersectional um, holistic approach, whether we're um, in the context of North Brooklyn and the South side of Williamsburg or in Bushwick, um, or we're looking at our, our comrades and our, our team in Puerto Rico, we're um, always looking at um, and always sure to prioritize um, collective self-determination while looking at solutions to very big problems, um, whether it's in the South Side where we have the BQE that cuts across um, our, our neighborhood and we have our public spaces where 
um, community members, just both young and old, convene, and um, whether it's being a part of uh, citizen science initiatives or um, cultural organizing, we recognize that we um, we're always taking an intersectional approach, and any solutions to these big problems must be led and informed by by the community. And we recognize that those solutions have always existed, and so that's what we always aim to prioritize in our work. Um, and so, with that being said, um, I'll pass it back to the. Um, oh no, we have Staten Island that needs to go. I'll pass it over. Um, Tom Berlanti, the other you'll have to hear from. Uh, my name is Linda Barron. I'm with the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are a business organization. We have uh, about 14,000 businesses on Staten Island and about a half a million people that live there. Um, we got involved. We we got involved in this. We've had some situations on Staten Island in terms of environment. With the uh, our dump, the, the Staten Island dump was open for many years. It's been closed. We celebrated the 20th anniversary of the closure this year, and actually, uh, we're still dealing with the, the dump and, and then you know kind of reinventing that area. We also had our East Shore was severely impacted by Hurricane Sandy, and we have a lot of pollution because uh, the Staten Island Expressway is considered they, they call it one of the world's biggest parking lots, actually, but. Our organization is a business organization, and the reason that I'm here is really so that we can pass along information to businesses. Businesses deal with all kinds of different energy bills, and they also have to prepare their workforces for the future. So there's a lot of things that we need to be aware of that we need to make. We act as a hub for businesses, uh, all the businesses that we serve in the borough. Plus, I have a collaborative relationship with all of the five borough chambers, so we constantly share information back and forth, and we think that it's really important to be at the table to hear firsthand what's going on so that we can relay this information. So not only will the businesses be aware of it, but our residents will be aware of it and be able to, to voice their opinion. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here and for your um, support on this project. It's really been an honor to work with each of you. Thank you so much. Great. Um, I would love to make a few, uh, take a few minutes to introduce council member Lincoln Ressler. He's here from this council, uh, this neighborhood is in your district, yes? So it's wonderful that you were able to make it. And if you'd like to come to say a few words, I know you've been a champion for climate action. So appreciate your return. Thank you so much, Claudia. It's great to be here. And I actually was just celebrating uh, NYU Tandon yesterday because one of the buildings here at MetroTech uh, has just been purchased by NYU and the School of Engineering is expanding, which is a you know, great thing for our efforts to solve climate challenges of climate change. And I really want to thank NYU for hosting us and their leadership. Uh, it's it's critically important. And I want to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, as the neighborhood council member, we've really centered uh, the fight against climate change uh, at the top of our agenda here in District 33. Uh, we've uh, released a climate roadmap for how we want to drive down emissions from our buildings, our transportation, our waste, uh, the resiliency solutions that we need to see in our waterfront district here. Uh, we, we just announced a new uh, tree plan where we're going to be planting 3,400 trees in every available tree bed across District 33 over the next four years. Uh, I believe very deeply that the solutions to the climate crisis are in our communities. And it's at town hall events like these where we bring together local leaders, uh, community members to share your expertise and your guidance and your input. That's how we're going to make progress together. And I want to thank the community-based organizations who have helped convene us and get the word out, especially El Puente representing Brooklyn um, and, and the mayor's office uh, for, for partnering and for engaging uh, because we need to do this work together, arm in arm in government and community to get everybody involved. The solutions to the climate crisis, I really do believe that the climate crisis is the single greatest threat facing the people of New York City uh, and the time for action is now. Uh, moderation is unacceptable. We need to, to implement the boldest, most ambitious solutions that we can. And I'm really excited to hear from all of you and work with all of you to make these things happen right here in District 33 and across the city of New York. So thanks for having me tonight. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, great. So we are now going to dive into the research area topics um, because we want to make sure that all of these somewhat complicated topics are accessible to everyone. We're going to start each section with a 101 delivered by our community-based organization partners. So really excited to ask Brianna to come back up to talk a little bit about uh, buildings and the ex uh, expected changes we're uh, going to be pushing for over the next decades. Thank you. Hi, everyone. 
thank you. I got a couple of highs. <laughs> uh, so as the slide says, people spend 90% of their time indoors, which is crazy. We need to get out more. And that's why it's so important that your building is healthy for you to live in, meaning it's free of health hazards like mold, lead, and asbestos. Is safe for you to live in, meaning it's free of natural gas that when burned in your apartment, like from your stove oops, or from your water boiler that runs usually on natural gas, that that releases toxic chemicals into your air in your apartment. And so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore. Um, that cannot happen by if we switch to electric heat pumps that are going to efficiently warm and cool your building, which are that image right there. So we also want to make sure your building is comfortable for you to live in. I mean, if you spend so much time on it, in it, you can, you want you to be able to afford the energy you're spending, spending in your building. So I want to do a quick survey with you all. How many of you have ever thought your building was too hot in the summer? Raise your hands. Yeah, me too, me too. Um, what if it's too cold in the winter? Yep, yep. And how many of you have ever thought your energy bill was too high when you saw it? I think that's majority of folks there. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, but three out of four Northern Manhattan neighborhoods are at the highest risk for dying during and immediately following an extreme heat event. These neighborhoods experience high temperatures due to a lack of green space like parks and have limited access to home and air conditioning. Research has shown that your indoor temperature can even be hotter than your outside temperatures. You're not imagining it. Uh, 2022 was one of our hottest summers on record as a result of climate change and increasing hot weather days leave many low-income residents unable to pay energy bills that can go up 30% from running your air conditioning. That's why affordable energy is so critical, given that many New Yorkers already cannot afford to own and operate an air conditioner, and that can have deadly consequences. So if you thought your building was too hot or too cold, that's why energy efficiency upgrades are so important. Some examples of what an energy efficiency upgrade looks like is replacing your water boiler, like I said, that usually runs on gas with a heat pump that runs on electricity. You can insulate your walls to keep you cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And you can upgrade your windows to prevent air from coming in. Right now, disadvantaged communities do not equitably receive amounts of funding from the state of New York to complete these beneficial home upgrades. They mostly already go to wealthy communities. And so that's why we act as pushing the state to fund the removal of lead, mold, and asbestos that makes you sick. So you can also receive the funding to install these energy efficiency upgrades that are healthy and make your home safe. So, and they also reduce your energy bill. If you're using less energy to do the same task that you are now, that means you're using less energy overall and that brings your bill down. So, we at We Act envision an energy future that runs on renewables, has electric buildings, gets gas out of your homes, involves community participation and decision making, is affordable, and contributes to the health and well being of you and your family. So, there are some challenges to reducing pollution from buildings. One, New York City electricity is expensive. Two, the labor force isn't yet ready to meet demand. And three grip updates, grid updates will be needed. And if you have more questions on this, there are opportunities for you to discuss more in our breakout session later. So thank you, everyone. Good evening. I think I can get away with that. Is that better? My name is Zachary Satili. I'm with E3. E3 is the consultant that's been hired to help with the research behind the power-up study. And before I dive in, we're going to go through lots of topics tonight, but a little bit of housekeeping quickly. 
So I'd like to first do an appreciation for Kinetic Communities, Daphne and Angel who put this event together. The hardest part is getting started and we're already on our way. So uh, they will be helping collect questions throughout tonight. So if you have questions about the topics, we're gonna go topic by topic. Uh, they're going to hand out flashcards and collect flashcards so we can have an orderly Q&A and make sure we get to everybody's questions throughout the night. So let me jump into buildings. So for this project, we identified several areas where we felt we needed to do more research so that we can put forward actions that the city can take come spring when we release the report. And buildings are obviously front and center, and that's why we're talking about them first. Building electrification, we're talking about scaling up heat pumps. We must install many, many, many heat pumps. There are a million buildings in New York City. It's gonna take a long time to retrofit all of them. The city has really made some strides very recently in this regard. First off, Burning fossil fuels in buildings is going to be prohibited in most newly constructed buildings by 2027. That's not that far away. Local law 154 passed in December of last year, and that's jump-starting this whole industry. But we know the costs are going to be very significant. So the research that we formulated is really evaluating how heat pump technologies and different building types compare to the conventional systems that are in our buildings now. We know that there's high upfront costs. We also know that sometimes they're more expensive to operate. However, we also believe that they are gonna be significant sources of reduced air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to go forward with this plan. And our research is really focused on assessing the cost gap to understand how we're gonna fund this. We focused in a few areas on multifamily housing. So I'm gonna walk through how we've landed on this topic. So the research is going to cover lots of different technologies, but we're going to zoom in on what we're describing here as unsubsidized, rent-stabilized, affordable housing. We chose this for a number of reasons. We felt that market rate housing has already been sufficiently studied. NYCHA has a tremendous plan on how they're going to electrify and we felt that rent stabilized buildings have very unique challenges. One, there's going to be a challenge on how this is gonna be funded and how this is ultimately gonna be, who's gonna bear the burden of these investments. So on the right, the graphic looks like it got a little screwed up, but the green represents the rent stabilized population as far as units. The blue, is market rate and those other smaller sectors are rent controlled, public housing, et cetera. So all we're highlighting here is that rent stabilized is a massive part of our building stock and there's not a great solution on how we're gonna electrify it today. So we're gonna do some, this is not supposed to be pedantic in any way. We wanna show that this is a pretty straightforward calculation that we can do. We know there's gonna be high costs. Those costs include the upfront cost of weatherization, which is gonna be critical, the cost of the actual equipment, and then many of the costs of things that are gonna block electrification, like health and safety repairs that need to be taken care of prior to the installation of a heat pump. We also know that once a heat pump is installed, you're gonna see increased electric bills because you're switching from a fuel uh, like gas or oil. However, there's tremendous benefit and there's tremendous support for this. The federal government and the state have fantastic incentives for weatherization. Those can be layered with new incentives for electrification. And then if you saw the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act recently, massive tax credits are now coming forward and the federal government is gonna foot a substantial part of this bill you also will have the benefits of reduced fuel bills when you switch from a fossil fuel to electric. We believe there will be a big gap still. And what our research is focused on is how large is that gap? Where is it most prominent in what sorts of buildings and what sorts of technologies are gonna create the largest gap? And then how can the city move forward with a plan 
that ultimately closes that gap. Claudia spoke a bit about energy burden. So I won't get deep into this, but electricity bills are likely going to increase because gas bills or increase more so than your gas bills will decrease. And what we're most concerned about is renters in a situation where their heat is now on their electric bill. We need to be very clear about ultimately who's going to pay for that heat, whether it be electric or fuel. The government may need to help fill this gap. And we ultimately want to make sure that those who are most energy cost burdens are not more so because of this transition. So this is a, a wonky chart, but what we're trying to show here on the left, red is all the cost. And don't focus too closely on the numbers right now. This is a preliminary analysis, but we're using this as a representation of what a retrofit would look like in a pre-war multifamily building that's less than seven stories. You have costs right up front for those health and safety improvements, taking care of cracks, mold, lead, et cetera. We've tried to estimate on a per unit basis over the life cycle of the equipment, what that costs. We then look at the incremental cost of the new equipment that you have to pay up front, the incremental increased electricity bill, and maybe some increased O&M cost. And then you start working down the waterfall. And when you get to that blue tall chart, a bar in the center, that's what we envision to be what it costs, where the benefits land before there's any incentive. And really what that represents is a tremendous amount of cost per unit, a massive amount. You start layering in all the incentives that exist today. And when you get to the far end of that chart, you still have that cost gap. So what we're working on now is trying to determine exactly how large that is. So we went through, and we're going to go through all the topics very, very quickly. And I have one minute remaining, but I don't need any more minutes because really the purpose of tonight is to flash up what we're doing and where we're at. Most of the research is in process. And then get feedback, have you ask questions, challenge us, help us refine our analysis so that as we go into the, into the holiday season and into the spring, we're actually... Um, making sure that we're landing on, on something that we can all stand behind and that's actually going to move the needle. So I'm going to stop there. And I think we should pause for questions. And I'm not sure how we're going to facilitate that. If you want to do that, pass them to me. Okay, so the first question is, can more information be provided on local on 97, as quite a few New York City buildings fall into that code, and it's a two-parter, what can regular renters do to report building issues besides 311? So I don't feel equipped to answer that second one. I'm not sure if there's anybody in the team. What can regular renters do to report billing issues besides 311? I assume Pulp would be the best resource. Yeah, so... Can everyone in the room hear me? Great. So, for folks that are looking for uh, building support, uh, there is Pulp as well as HeartShare, which is a nonprofit located in Brooklyn, New York, that can provide you with building assistance for your utility bills. So, I encourage you to look at heartshare.org. And then um, you can also reach out to the utilities directly. They do have a billing assistance program and a billing payment option um, where they can provide you with um, billing assistance for income eligible resident renters. And regarding Local Law 97, so there's, there's many, many resources. And Local Law 97 applies to not just multifamily properties, but also commercial properties, also the city itself. So I would say if you're a uh, commercial or multifamily building and you're a larger customer, uh, I would encourage you to reach out to the Accelerator, the New York City Accelerator, which has lots of information as a free resource. Uh, Daphne, do you want to give a quick plug for Electrify? Yes. So New York City has two initiatives. One is the NYC Accelerator, which is a free technical advisory program for multifamily buildings over five units across the five boroughs. And so if you need any support, if you have any questions about your building systems and how to make them more efficient, that is a free resource to you all. 
Um, for folks that are in the one to four family home, there is another initiative called Electrify NYC, which is focused first on health and comfort. So ensuring that you have the proper insulation, the proper health and safety protocols, and then help you look at solar plus um, heat pumps and making sure that they're doing it in a cost-effective way that does not increase the financial burden to homeowners. And lastly, there are a lot of utility programs. There's affordable multifamily program and a residential energy program run by the Joint Utilities of New York, so National Grid and Con Ed and all the other fun utilities um, that are also a free resource to you all, so you can look at their website. And we'll share all these resources um, in the email. Sorry, guys, I was eating. <laughs> um, what is Pulp? Pulp is a um, free resource for people to use. They're lawyers, and they have all languages pretty much available to you. Um, so you can email them. You can call them. They have a hotline. Their website is utilityproject.org. And so if you do have anything that you need help with regarding your utility bill, if you have a problem with your energy supplier, such as Con Edison or National Grid, you can go to Pulp and they are more than happy to help you. And you can share that resource with anyone else you know struggling with utility debt. What they do is they help you enroll in state programs like some of the ones mentioned. And there are some state programs available to eliminate utility debt right now until December 31st, 2022. Um, and so that is the energy affordability program for anyone wondering. So just wanted to provide some extra context. Thank you. And lots of questions came in. So I'm gonna try to get to all of them, oh, even more. So where's all the electricity gonna come from? We're gonna get to that one later. Could be, oh, could be, how would we prevent how do we prevent and future ideologies so that renters aren't footing the bill? How are you planning to implement ideas if they're still in the research with few projected plans? How do you get to enacting and moving forward? So I'll take the second one first. So this study is intending to be quite different than I think a lot of the plans that many cities produce. Um, You'll probably be frustrated with how specific some of this research is as we go through it. It's very much because we think it's unlocking some of the blocks that are preventing action from happening. So the report that you'll see in the spring is going to be very action oriented with specific initiatives that are measurable, and they're all going to be touching on each of the topics we're going to talk about tonight. The could be, I think, is in reference to the unknown about who's gonna pay for this. And I think that our research is really focused on trying to demystify exactly that question. There are a lot of, well, we'll figure it out type conversations happening. And I think when it comes to rent stabilized housing, there's even more so. So I think we're gonna put forward lots of information about what the blocks are so that the city can take action and move forward with a plan to actually uh, unlock some of those those challenges and answer some of those questions. Would the drastic increase in pricing cause a larger disparity? Absolutely. And I think that's why we're doing this research is we feel that that hasn't been identified as large of a problem as it actually is. There is going to be a massive disparity if we don't intervene and make sure that buildings actually have the tools they need to, to make these improvements and find a way to fund the improvements. Wouldn't local law 97 help provide a significant stream of revenue to equitably fund the transition? Very good question. I think it's, it's something that we'll see as local law 97 rulemaking is completed. There'll be lots of more information about how the, the fines will be enforced, where those fines will go. And I think a lot of uh, thought will be put into exactly what can be done with that revenue source. Sure. I think one question I heard was, how do we protect tenants or renters? And so from building costs, one piece of legislation that WEAC supports and 
will likely be fighting for next legislative session, which means to pass policy into law, is something called good cause eviction. And what that is, it's a policy that would protect renters from being evicted unfairly if the renter, if the landlord raises someone's rent unfairly, that they can no longer afford it, it would block that tenant from being evicted. So that is something that is on our radar. And we are interested in passing this in conjunction with advocating for energy efficiency, because we know that some rent landlords may be shady and they may want to pass energy efficiency cost upgrades onto tenants unfairly. And so that is why it's important that we are also looking out for renter rights and tenant protections. And Daphne or Angel, let me know so we can stay on schedule because we may have to pull some of these questions into the breakouts if we can't get to all of them. Uh, great question. Why is New York City electricity so expensive and what's being done about it? Also, where does it come from? So the second part, I think, is easier to answer. And we're going to talk more about this. Uh, a lot of the energy that comes into the city comes from outside, comes into the city from outside, whether that be from, uh, from upstate. If you're uh, following the headlines the last couple of weeks, they just broke ground on bringing some power from Canada down into New York City. There's some power that comes in from New Jersey. And then there's a lot of power that's generated in the city for reliability purposes. So the energy comes from all over and the energy mix is primarily fossil. Uh, there's a second question I think I just saw it about was nuclear energy analyzed as a viable alternative? There was a nuclear power plant in New York City that served, uh, or excuse me, that was up in Buchanan, New York, that served New York City that was closed, Indian Point. Most of that generation was replaced by fossil. So our, our, from a carbon standpoint, our grid actually got dirtier when we closed that nuclear power plant. Uh, there's no new nuclear really being built at large scale anywhere in the United States right now because of cost. And I think I only have one more minute and there's a few good questions. I'm gonna try to take one more and then we're gonna save the rest for the, for the breakouts. How, does, how do geothermal heat loops fit into the clean energy equation? So since I had to go through the research very quickly, I didn't touch on the different types of heat pumps, but we are looking at geothermal heat pumps as part of this research. So there's many types of heat pumps. Some of them are uh, called ground source heat pumps or geothermal heat pumps. Those leverage the fact that underground, you have a pretty constant temperature that can be used for cooling and heating. There's also air source heat pumps that pull heat out of the air. Uh, both technologies are viable, both are being considered. So Daphne, should I move on to the next section because of time? Okay. So I'm gonna keep these. Before we bring up the wonderful Leslie, uh, I want to inform everyone that WE Act also has a survey. So WE Act staff, raise your hands. Let everyone know who you are. Thank you. Uh, you can come to myself, Annika, Caleb, or Lonnie to do a survey with us. If you have an energy story, you want to tell us if your building or your utility company has been treating you unfairly, if you have high energy bills, if your building is too hot or too cold, let us know. That is really helpful information, and we want to help take care of you all. So please come to us, any of us, and we can, we can do that survey with you. Thank you. Great. I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take one more because it's a very great question on what does health and safety entail, um, and th don't put that put that down. This is a good question. So, what does health and safety entail? I just want to go back to that quickly. So, this is a critical point. So, we've included the cost of health and safety, and what that means can mean a variety of things. But before you put a heat pump in, you're going to want to do a lot of things to reduce the overall cost of the system. You're going to want to think about energy efficiency first. You're going to certainly also want to think about what we're calling health and safety here, which is fixing cracks, mold, asbestos, all the other things you're going to encounter when you start opening up walls, 
you start trying to run new conduit. These are all things that typically are kept out of the equation, but they're the reason why these projects don't happen often. So I just wanted to touch on that. I think that's great. And let's, let's jump to transportation so I don't get us too far behind. And Leslie, do you want to join us? Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. Just a quick reminder, uh, we're going to be passing around blue flashcards and you guys can place all of your transportation questions there and they will be collected at the end uh, and we'll answer some of your questions. So New Yorkers are, uh, they live in the most transit oriented city in America. Um, because New York is such a densely populated city, there needs to be a lot of public transportation, a lot of um, accessible transportation um, resources for New Yorkers to get around. Now, New York City um, emits 28% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and are comprised of transportation emissions. And we are aiming to have 80% of trips taken within the five boroughs um, so that they could uh, be less, uh, so that they could emis, emit less energy, uh, I'm so sorry, less pollution by walking, taking bikes, um, and mass transit by 2050. Now, electrifying vehicles in our streets um, are key in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if we have electric vehicles, we will no longer be emitting carbon dioxide into the air. And that has a lot of correlations that lead to cumulative impacts if they are not addressed. For example, because we have such high emissions of carbon dioxide in the air, that means that, we that it is able to trap more heat. Meaning that in the summer temperatures, our low-income communities that reside in heavily dense um, transportation areas and are next to highways, have buses and trains near them, um, that means that they are the ones who experience the most exacerbated versions of heat vulnerability, uh, meaning that transportation is a direct cause to a lot of the health disparities that we see with high temperatures as well. Electrifying vehicles also lowers the risk of respiratory illnesses. As I mentioned, the South Bronx is one of the highest, has one of the highest asthma rates in the whole country. Um, the other boroughs in New York City follow that as well. And so if we have less carbon dioxide in our air and less um, particulate matter emitters um, that cause so much harm in our health, the, in the health of our communities, electrifying these vehicles also reduces um, that impact as well. It reduces noise pollution as well as um, it ends our dependency on fossil fuels. Now, some of the challenges that we face uh, for reducing pollution from transportation is that there are limited charging infrastructure that allows for the adoption of electric vehicles. So because uh, the charging uh, electric vehicles is not as common as green, uh, fossil fuel emitting vehicles, um, the charging stations are limited. However, we plan on um, transition it on having at least 10,000 charging curbside um, chargers by the year 2030. Now, another issue is that sourcing electric vehicles can be difficult. Um, however, a lot of electric vehicle sources are planning on making electric vehicles that have a longer range and have a larger capacity to function properly in our new. Um, electric economy. And the last challenge is that grid upgrades need to be um, need to be changed. So because electric vehicles have a higher voltage and energy, the grid needs to be uh, more resilient and more reliable so that we can make sure that our vehicles will uh, will be reliable for our use. And yeah, I think this is the, yeah. Thank you. I already got questions before we started. Uh, so will making transportation more sustainable significantly increase riding costs? So I think it's to be determined, certainly. Um, 
the challenge with EVs is, is upfront costs. We need to find a way to fund them. Uh, the cost of ownership of an EV is likely to be a lot cheaper. So it's really, if uh, in many ways, it's finance and supply chain, I think is the, the short answer there on whether or not it's gonna be more or less expensive. And I'll get to these, let me get to these after because there's a lot. So, uh, hold on, thanks. Okay, so we zoomed in here. We're talking about just school buses now. And I think it's important just to highlight some of the progress that's been made recently. So both New York City and New York State require all electric school buses by 2035. And this is gonna dramatically reduce the harmful health and climate impacts of the diesel emissions that come from our existing buses. And then also in addition to that, any new purchase of a school bus needs to be electric by 2027. And those are both very recent announcements. This blew my mind when I first heard it. There's 10,000 school buses in New York City. It's tremendous. School buses are also very expensive today, three to four times the cost in some cases. The good news is that there's a lot of money going into this space. The federal government has put tremendous amounts of money in the Infrastructure Act and has just doubled down really with uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. So there's a lot of funding coming to help seed this market and get school buses uh, into our communities. What we did with our research is we want to just better understand today what the costs are, what the benefits are, compare that to conventional vehicles. We've already committed to doing it. So now we're thinking about how do we defray the cost as much as we can? And one of the areas we're looking at, and I'll talk about more, is called vehicle to grid. And it's thinking about how these large batteries that are going to be sitting idle for large periods of the day and maybe some seasons in the summer where they're getting less use, what can we do with those batteries when they're not driving children around the city? So what we're doing right now is analyzing school bus route data to really understand when these buses need to be driving and when they're not. We really wanna know, and it's in the, in the field, it's called, when do they sleep? When does a bus pull into a depot? When does it pull over to the side of the road? Where are there opportunities to use that bus when it's not operating for its primary purpose? And buses are real. The reason why there's so much interest in, in school buses right now is they have such well-defined travel patterns. Unlike, say, an Uber that is going to be following customers all day and trying to ride constantly, a school bus has a very distinct time when it rides and a very distinct time when it sleeps. So what we're doing is looking at different ways that you can control the cost of a school bus and when you operate it. So there's something called managed charging. That essentially is just playing off the fact that electricity doesn't cost the same throughout the day. So there's times of day and times of year when electricity is cheaper and you wanna take advantage of those. And you really wanna do that not only as an individual school bus operator, or somebody that's managing the, the buses, but also societally, we wanna make sure that we're controlling the amount of electricity that these chargers are using so that we're not increasing the peak of our electric system. The other thing we're looking at is what I mentioned earlier, which is vehicle to grid. And we don't need to get into the, the details as far as the economics right now, because we're just getting started with this analysis. But ultimately the thought process is there's gonna be time when you can discharge extra electricity in the battery and potentially get on a tariff with the utility where you can get paid for that. So vehicle to grid is not just applicable to school buses, it's really applicable to all vehicles, but we think it's a, that school buses could be a great candidate. And since we've already committed to buying all these, uh, these buses all around the country, we might as well think about uh, this infrastructure and what we can do with it. And then when we get deeper into the analysis, and you'll see this in the fall, when, or excuse me, in the spring when we release it, uh, we're going to be doing lots of sensitivities to think about how to make this cheaper. You can charge multiple buses off a single charger that could reduce costs. There's going to be some analysis around more expensive chargers or less expensive chargers based on 
the power capacity of those charges and how quickly they can charge. So we're going to be doing lots of iterations of this analysis to try to find the optimal way to actually manage the bus fleet. So I'm going to jump to the next topic and we're going to go through a few and then take another break. So this is grid readiness. This is another topic. So we're building up to essentially this topic. We've talked about electrifying buildings. We've talked about electrifying uh, school buses and other vehicles. So now we're thinking about, okay, this is a lot of new electrical load. And right now, New York City's peak electricity demand currently happens in the summer, really happens during heat waves. And it's really happening when we're blasting our air conditioning. As we switch to electric heat, as we add a lots of electric vehicles, over time, the prediction is that that peak is going to change to the winter. The reason the peak is so important is because the system is designed to the peak, and that's what drives all the cost. So if it switches to the winter and then ultimately the peak increases, there's lots of costs and vision down the road. And how are we going to make sure that we manage that peak the best we can? That's what the whole game is going to be about. So this is really just trying to predict when and where we think electrification is going to happen. It's a tough thing to predict, but there's lots of, uh, there's lots of tools you can use to try to envision where this is going to happen first. Some of that's just need. So where in the city are we going to need a lot of electric vehicles? Where do we have communities that have predominantly residential buildings that are going to have heat pumps? Throughout the city, you're going to have an uneven adoption. Uh, income is certainly going to drive a lot of adoption. We need to predict how income is going to drive that adoption and where adoption may not happen because of income. And Ultimately, what we're trying to do is layer on all these different factors so that we can inform the grid upgrading plan so that we're doing this more strategically and it's all to manage cost. So this is a very, very preliminary map on the right, but New York City's grid, and now we're talking about essentially Con Edison's grid, the distribution, the local distribution grid. It's made up of networks and what networks are, are essentially groupings that together create the broader grid. Sometimes physically, there's a limit on how much power you can get in the certain communities. And, and what Con Edison's primary role is, is to upgrade their networks and maintain that supply of electricity to all of us reliably. But over time, as we forecast where adoption is gonna happen, we can look at the existing system today and we can look at what we think is gonna happen in the future and we can start trying to make some predictions. So what this map is starting to show, and there's gonna be many of these in the report and really what the purpose of these is, don't read into anything other than the fact that all those little lines on, on New York City represent physical parts of our grid. And We've isolated at that level and said, we think we know what's in those communities. We can try to predict where there's gonna be higher peaks because of that. And then we compare that to kind of this existing plan and say, maybe we can help inform where we think we're gonna have challenges. And this can not only reduce costs, we can think about uh, air quality considerations. There's lots of other uh, outputs that come out of this, this analysis. But really, we just want to try to get a view of what the future is going to look like. And that's what this analysis is about. So before break, I, I shouldn't have teased you with that. Um, how will electrification impact the grid? So very timely. Are there any improvements being done to maintain the, uh, its capacity? So absolutely. So that's, like I said, that's Con Edison's primary role is improving and maintaining the grid. And that's what we pay them for. Um, and all around the country, there's utilities just like Con Edison that get paid to maintain the quality of the grid. All utilities are now thinking about what electrification is gonna do to their grid. And in a cold climate like New York, you have different challenges than you do in other parts of the country where maybe they're not gonna have as big a concern with a winter peak like we will in, in New York City. We truly imagine that over time, and there's all sorts of predictions on it's going to be 2035 or later, when do we think the grid is going to switch from a, at a system-wide level, a summer peaking grid to a winter peaking grid? The other wrinkle that's happening here is think about when it's really cold and when you need the most heat, it's usually overnight. 
So now we're also switching to a nighttime peaking grid. The reason why that map is ultimately going to be very informative when it's finalized is it's going to show us that at a system level, you have challenges, and then on a, on a network level, those little shapes on that map, you have even different challenges. Much of the area we're in right now in Brooklyn is nighttime peaking, meaning that in this isolated part of the grid right now, Con Edison is struggling to, to maintain a peak overnight, or really actually to about 11 p.m., and then power uh, uh, usage goes down. In other parts of the city, especially commercial districts, you have uh, the opposite, you have a daytime peak. So it's not an easy thing to determine what's going to happen in the future, but we certainly can make some predictions, and that's what we're going to try to do with this. Following up on the high cost of electricity in the city, how will tra the transition to EV be affordable? I think I tried to answer that one. That's a very tough question. I think that we're going to have to think about what incentives we can put in the market so that EV ownership is affordable. Uh, I'm aware that the Department of Transportation, DCAS Fleet, TLC, lots of divisions of, of uh, agencies in New York City are all creating electrification plans on how they're actually going to get more EVs into their, uh, into their fleets. Are you going to use the lamppost as a charging station? Uh, certainly, that's being considered. I, I can't really answer that question. That's not my area of expertise, but I think there's a real challenge thinking about curbside charging. Just think about what happens to any infrastructure that's in the street. It gets damaged, it gets vandalized. There's danger sometimes in having this in the street. So there's a lot of thinking that still needs to be done about where the optimal place to charge is, whether it be in a parking garage, at your home, in uh, new yet to be conceived, you know, uh, equivalence to what a gas station is today. These, these are all things that are being determined right now, but I'm not sure exactly if the, the lamppost would be, would be an option. Where's the funding for improvements come from? So I think that's, that's gonna be a combination of the, what we pay for electricity and where we take uh, public funds and invest it into the things we want to invest in. And if you're following a lot of the proceeding that the state uh, is going through right now for the Climate Act, so much of that is where are we going to push the funding so that we can make this affordable. With the increased public transportation prices, how will you convince people to take public transit? Th that honestly is, is kind of out of scope for, for our study, but I think certainly uh, the city has very clear goals about how they want to reduce the amount of rides that are actually taken in the EV or in a vehicle altogether. If we can promote and continue to promote public transit, we'll all be better off and we don't have to solve for some of these problems. I'm not sure. Are you going to add more bike lanes? Again, that's, that's kind of out of scope for this. Are you going to penalize non-electric transit? Uh, again, those are questions that I think are very much outside of the scope of what we're doing. They're certainly good questions, and I think they're questions that should be asked, but there's no plan in anything that we're working on about penalizing uh, non-electric transit. How can we push the city to install more chargers? 30,000 just isn't enough. Goal for 2030. So I think... Uh, the prediction is EVs are gonna come a lot faster than electric buildings for a variety of reasons. One is just what we call stock turnover. How long do you keep a vehicle versus how long do you keep a building? So the opportunities to replace old buildings with new don't really exist in our lifetime. It was so many of the buildings that we're in today are gonna to continue to exist. There is new construction certainly happening, but look on your block, how many of those buildings are new? It's, it's certainly not, uh, going to happen at the pace that I think vehicles are going to happen. So I believe that this topic in particular is so important because we're forecasting based on the policy goals, what are the actual, uh, if we just look at policy and just think about what we're we committing to, and those policy goals are set by trying to stay on track to achieve our climate goals. Uh, those are incredibly ambitious and there's no precedent for them. Um, 
there's not many markets that have really gone through this before. So this is a real opportunity for New York in a very, very dense environment to really be a real leader and think about how to roll this out. How many more uh, questions do we have time for? I'm just, last one. And thank you, I'm, I'm not trying to ignore anything here. This is an overwhelming number of questions for the amount of time that we have tonight. So. How do you expect to address the drivers and the communities? How do you expect to address the drivers and the communities that earn a living from conventional trucks and are not able to purchase electric vehicles? Uh, great question. I, I certainly don't have an answer to this. I will say that there is a lot of truck electrification planning that's going on right now in New York City thinking through uh, those who have fleets, you have the challenges of uh, where's the, where those trucks go, which communities they go through, where they come from. These are all big, big questions. I would say uh, there is no stick that I'm aware of right now that's preventing anybody from driving a conventional vehicle. Most of the interest is in carrots to help people adopt electric vehicles. How is equity prioritized? Great question. So we, I didn't really touch on that. So one of the outputs of the electrification study for school buses is really, it's that last bullet there. One of our work products is going to be a prioritization framework of how to think about which communities uh, we would recommend to be the first to get school buses. So or get these electric school buses. Uh, we need to think about working backwards from some of these goals. 2035 is not a long time, but to turn over 10,000 buses, it's very expensive. Like many cities, New York City has contractors and vendors that provide school buses to them. So ultimately, they will be responsible for electrifying their fleets. So uh, where we're uh, aiming this research is not only to help maybe find some financial tools to help, but then also to uh, direct the city and give them some information about where we think you're going to have the highest air quality benefits, where you think there may be opportunities to have uh, headroom on the existing electrical system, which will reduce cost. There's, there's lots of ways that we can think about prioritization, but equity is the primary way we're going to look at it. I'm out of time again. Re repeat this question. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, how is equity going to be prioritized in the implementation of school bus electrification? Okay, so many more. I think there's a buildings one in here too. <laughs> I think we're gonna have to do another town hall, Claudia. <laughs> okay, are we taking a break? Yeah, all right. Thank you um, everyone for coming back. Um, so at this point we've reached the halfway mark of our session today and the town hall, but before I turn it over to Zach again, I would actually like to speak about the current reality that we live in today. Um, and we're gonna hear in a few moments about transitioning our grid and uh, our grid readiness and how we can shift to clean energy. Um, what it means and what is uh, necessary to achieve it. Um, just to think about a few things here. Earlier this year, the state released this designation of disadvantaged communities in New York. Um, this came as no surprise to most of us uh, because we've been living and seeing and experiencing the historic disinvestment uh, in our communities and of our people. Um, if we go back in time, we can see that the city, that the city has historically cited its fossil fuel um, plants in our communities that is um, primarily responsible for almost like a quarter of New York City's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And if we are working on releasing plans and analyzing just ways of energy transition, we need to think about how these plants need to be retired uh, in favor of clean energy uh, storage facilities and clean energy projects. And that must include meaningful ways and uh, meaningful input and meaningful involvement of our communities. So this is why sessions like this are really important. This is why this needs to keep on happening within the process to inform 
how we shift towards clean energy. Um, so the siting of these new facilities uh, that are clean energy that rely on non-polluting, um, uh, I wouldn't say fuels, but you know, resources, um, should be a pathway to create direct investment into our communities through uh, green jobs, through reduced pollution. This transition would also allow New York City's um, building sector and transportation sector to comply with uh, historic laws like Local Law 97 uh, that we fought so hard to pass a few years back and that we are in the process of rulemaking today. Um, we are in a moment where our communities and communities of color and even globally, um, communities that have been disadvantaged by the fossil fuel industries, by business as usual, are rejecting um, kind of how, how to say this, are rejecting these notions of transition fuels like natural gas, are uh, rejecting notions like net zero when we actually want zero emissions. Um, and so in our position here as community-based organizations that are working in tandem with, uh, con with our consultant partners and with MOCEJ, we urge everyone in positions of power to exercise their privilege in approaching this shift through an intersectional lens because we are no longer isolated and separated as communities. We are part of a global movement. We are part of a local and state movement. And so uh, we listen to each other and we speak and we stand together. So with that, I'm gonna welcome Zach again and to hear about transitioning our grid. Thank you. So there's a number of topics in this section. Uh, we're gonna start with energy storage. So this topic is really focused on opportunities to deploy battery storage in New York City to help facilitate uh, retirement of fossil power plants. Storage is gonna play an important role in this transition in New York and all around the world, really, because at its simplest form, what storage allows you to do is charge during times when you have high renewable output and then discharge during times of the highest demand. We also aim to identify what key considerations should be used when siting storage on both city-owned and on private property. So in order to answer these questions, we're doing some modeling of the New York City electricity system and we chose the year 2030. Lots of major policy goals uh, exist in that year. One of the most important is New York City committed to 70% renewable energy by 2030. And what we're doing is we're simulating what we think the electricity mix is going to be in 2030 and assessing the impacts of all the renewable, renew, renewable projects and additional transmission that's being built. And really what the goal is here is we wanna identify opportunities for energy storage as a potential solution to offset some of the run hours of these fossil plants that exist in our communities. We also wanna identify key considerations where it can be built. And we want to develop a prioritization framework, again, similar to the EV research on where those installations should go in order to accelerate the retirement of these fossil plants, many of them in EJ communities. So for this research, as we discussed in the previous topics, we think electricity demand is going to increase. Uh, we know it's going to increase because we're going to have lots of new electric vehicles and electric heat. And you're essentially taking things that are primarily served right now by fossil fuels and converting to electricity. So the electricity consumption is going to increase. And what we've done here is we've said on the left, I'll start with the graphic. So 2021, that's almost today, it's 2022, I know, but we're using data from 2021 to just show a baseline of how New York City got its, what the New York City electricity generation was in that year. 
And then to the right is a simulation of what we think is going to happen in 2030. And it's important to do that simulation because there's a lot of commitments already made. There's a lot of contracts signed. There's a lot of new resources are going to come online. And a lot of these resources, that colorful mix, are a lot of renewables. You have hydro, you have onshore and offshore wind. The yellow is utility scale solar being imported from primarily upstate. So you have lots of, lots of new, cleaner resources coming online. And we think that that's going to displace a lot of the generation that's happening today. So on this map, the little dots represent power plants in New York City. And the colors, and it may be hard to see, but there's a, a color scale there. And the darker the color, the more we assume that plant's going to operate in this simulation. So what we're trying to predict is when you bring in all these new renewable resources, what's the energy gonna mix going to look like on an hour by hour basis in the year 2030, assuming uh, what we think the weather is going to be like. And ultimately, we simulate how often we think those plants are going to run. So there's something called capacity factor on that map. That's essentially how often it's going to run as a percentage over the course of the year. So the light pink dots we think are plants that potentially are gonna run a lot less. They're less than 1%. So that's a pretty dramatic amount of time that they're not operating. And they're online to ensure the reliability of the system. And there is an economic incentive for many of them to operate. We think that may go away and you're gonna see lots of these plants potentially not operating at all. So the reason we went through that analysis is we ultimately want to think about how storage could displace that. So if they're only running a short period of time, energy storage is limited. It has to charge and discharge. And throughout uh, the year, energy storage has to do that cycle. And we need to match that cycle compared to how a power plant would operate. It's going to be some plants that are not going to be able to be replaced with energy storage today with today's technology because the storage won't be, it won't be uh, economic to build the storage to replace a long output of a power plant over a long period of time. So let me just see, make sure I, uh, so ultimately what our modeling suggests is that as this declines in 2030, uh, we're potentially going to see a larger decline statewide than we would in the city. And that's based on our simulation. So the reason why that's happening is because New York City is a load pocket, very congested. It's difficult to get electricity here. So even with some of the new resources that are coming online, we still envision that there will be a decline in fossil in the city, but not as much as it is statewide. We do envision that some of these plants, many of them, are going to retire. They're going to have to retire because of regulations that were passed on their air on air pollution. So many of these plants in the coming years are going to close because of policy. But there's going to be additional plants that may just not operate because it's not economic in the face of these renewable uh, and other resources that come online and new transmission that's being built. So on this slide. There's additional dots and what those additional dots represent, the power plants are still there, but those additional dots are, we're doing a pretty detailed assessment of the tax lots, uh, both public and private, that potentially could be good candidates for storage. And right now the analysis is looking at the size of the lots, we're looking at zoning, we're looking at permitting and safety restrictions, we're looking at their proximity to uh, to uh, higher voltage grid infrastructure and substations as a proxy for maybe reduced costs to connect into those. And then we're also obviously in New York City where land is very valuable. There's lots of competing resources and there's also lots of very important reasons why storage may not be the best candidate. So there's lots of competing uses for this land, but we've tried to pick land that is either vacant or doesn't have other uses identified and just use this as an opportunity to start a dialogue around whether or not there's enough room on that land to put large batteries that can ultimately uh, 
help with the potential closure of fossil plants in the city. So lots of questions and I'll try to take them in the order I got them. Um, what effort is being done for a smart grid locally built? So Con Edison has been installing smart meters for, for several years now. I can't off the top of my head say exactly when they're gonna be completely done, but I know they've been going borough by borough and putting smart meters in. Smart meters are seen as kind of the underpinning of a smart grid, starting to be able to get more granular information about when people are using electricity and what opportunities there may be to shift. I'm out of time already? Wow. All right, I'm gonna to try to answer a few more. Does energy need to be stored near the city or can it be from far away? So I think the answer is both. So since we're a load pocket, for liability reasons, we need to generate a lot of power or have storage options to provide a lot of power in times of high need. But New York City has always survived off of electricity that comes from elsewhere. Uh, maybe if you go all the... Sure. Um, maybe we will... Three minutes now? Okay. Maybe we will be... Uh, if you go all the way back to the first power plant that was built in New York City, we were pretty self-sufficient then. But it's been a long time since we've been able to survive without importing power. And that is likely to remain the case for a long period of time. What percent of New York City emissions are associated with peakers? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we certainly can calculate it and others in the room may, but I, I don't know that answer off the top of my head. I will tell you that 70% uh, is associated with buildings, but within that 70% is, is the, uh, the electrical consumption. There's no way I'm gonna get to all these in three minutes. Uh, when the, when the materials used for sustainability, who, how will they be disposed of chemicals? Okay, I think I understand. So this is, this is a common question that many are asking. Sure. There's, there's, certain, there's definitely truth to the fact that it takes raw materials, it takes lots of energy to generate renewable energy to generate salt, to, to make and manufacture solar panels. There's chemicals and batteries. This is all certainly something that is understood and being looked at. Also with heat pumps, there's lots of discussion about refrigerants and whether or not those refrigerants are also contributing to global warming. These are all truths that we shouldn't deny happen. Uh, and it's also something that is very much in the, in the dialogue as we think about this transition. I think the one thing that I can say with absolute certainty, because most of what I've said tonight is, well, we're trying to figure it out. We are definitely going to install technology and then replace it. If you look at how often you replace your phone these days, we are moving at such a fast pace. The first EV charger that you put in your garage is, is probably gonna only last a little bit of time before better technology comes out. Those are all things that we need to consider in this transition. They're very much, things that remain at the top of the pile as we think about this, and they shouldn't be ignored by any means. But there's no easy answers to that. I think we need to weigh the needs of communities versus the needs of the city versus the needs of our economy and start thinking about these and having a dialogue about these simultaneously and making some clear-headed decisions about exactly which of, there's no panacea to any of these, these questions. What are transmission lines? So. And do, does more transmission need to be built to meet our electrification goals? Where, why, and how? So in its simplest form, transmission lines are just larger, larger electrical uh, lines that transmit higher amounts of electricity over longer, period, uh, longer distances. So when we think about uh, the wires that serve your home, those are much smaller. They carry less voltage than the ones that are much larger that you see maybe um, in your communities. You may see them uh, when you're driving along the highway. Uh, those are transmission lines. They, they carry uh, higher, more dangerous voltage of electricity over longer periods. And we do that because there's less losses. Uh, we certainly need more transmission. So the state has committed to building lots of new transmission. Uh, 
Transmission hasn't been built in my lifetime in this area. And for the first time, it is actually being built. Uh, it's very, very expensive. There's lots of challenges with land use. And New York State has committed to build uh, uh, two major transmission lines that are going to help New York City bring more clean power into the city. One is the Champlain Hudson Power Expressway, which I alluded to earlier, which just broke ground. And the other is Clean Path. Those were both awarded um, contracts recently. And more transmission will definitely be necessary because we're talking about lots of more electricity needed to, to uh, fuel this, this transition to a cleaner grid. Okay, I'm out of time on that topic. So I'm going to move as quickly as I can through. I think there's two more. So urban wind, this is a fun one. Uh, and it's fun for a few reasons. One is we're not going to talk about what I think most folks would want to talk about tonight, which is offshore wind. Now, offshore wind is a major part of New York City's commitments, uh, excuse me, New York State's commitments. And then really every state on the Atlantic seaboard is thinking about offshore wind in a major way. Here we're talking about urban wind and we're doing this study. This is a requirement that came from a uh, local law. Uh, can't remember off the top of my head exactly which one, it's several years old, but we're looking at uh, whether or not there's a big opportunity for smaller wind turbines. So you see on the right, that's the only commercially uh, commercial scale wind turbine that's in New York City, it's in Sunset Park at the Sims uh, Municipal uh, Recycling Facility. I think it's a, roughly about 100 megawatts. And that's the only one that's been built. There are several other, on the right, you'll see smaller, different types of technology. These are attached to rooftops. And then Sims again is in the bottom corner. These are the best examples of wind that's been done in New York City. And I won't say they're great examples for a number of reasons. One is, Small-scale wind is very expensive compared to larger resources. There no, there's no economies of scale. And then in the built environment, there's lots of physical reasons why urban wind is difficult. One is because if you think about wind coming into the city, it's not to say it's not windy in New York City, but when you think about how these wind turns operate, they, they like strong wind that's consistent. In New York City, you have gusts of winds and turbulent winds, and that's all cities have this where as the, the wind comes in, it gets, uh, it gets moved through the buildings and, and it just, it's not in a, in a format really that can allow these uh, turbines to, to operate well. So there have been a few successful installations, but most of them are not economic. And most of the trials that have been done in New York City have not proven out to be uh, viable. So what we did is we did some modeling on the right, you'll see, uh, we are looking specifically at taller buildings, thinking that there'd be uh, good opportunities on maybe the taller rooftops. So what we have are dots for buildings that are over uh, 100 feet or waterfront areas that would be good candidates. And really what we determined is that uh, less than 1% of the, the lots we looked at were really good candidates. And most of our modeling suggested that, that there'd be poor, uh, there'd be a poor wind resource, meaning that it wouldn't generate enough electricity for the cost, um, especially when you compare what, what else you could use that land for or that rooftop for. In almost all the lots we, lots we looked at, uh, there's more opportunity to generate electricity with solar than there would be wind. So our key takeaways with the study, and this is probably of all the research that we've done, this is the one that we're the furthest along on kind of what our final takeaways are. And that's that urban wind really has limited potential with today's technology in New York City. And we're not recommending to the city that they should prioritize this transition uh, using these smaller scale wind turbines. And this is my last topic. So do I have time to do this last one? Okay. Okay, so public land, and I saved this one the last, I think this is one of the most exciting ones. And it's really thinking about how New York City can make more progress on its ambitious targets for both solar and storage. So there's a citywide goal of 1,000 megawatts or one gigawatt of solar power by 2030. There's also a goal for storage of 500 megawatts by 2025. We need to accelerate our progress on both of these goals. And one of the ideas is thinking about how can uh, the city as the largest 
property owner think about making public land available for clean energy to meet these goals? So on the right, there's a kind of a humorous representation of what community solar is. You'll see the, the Castros and David, and it's just a simplified way to describe what, what is really happening here. But we're trying to identify opportunities for the city to scale up community solar. And what community solar would allow is residents to purchase solar power without installing solar panels of, of their own. And there's a lot of reasons why. You could be a renter, many of us are. You could not have an opportunity to, uh, or, or the capital to put it on your roof. There's lots of reasons why this may be a better option. It also provides access to, uh, significant access to lower income uh, communities and the opportunity to really capture some pretty nice incentives that exist for bill savings. So what we'd like to do is evaluate what financial opportunities may exist and look at really the city land and rooftops and figure out if there's opportunities for community solar. So the reason why we're so excited about this is the feds have committed to ponying up a lot of money for at least another 10 years. And that's represented by those bar charts. ITC stands for the investment tax credit. That's a primary funding mechanism for all solar today. Essentially is a, is a money back coupon if you have tax appetite. And this is how much, most solar is funded today. But with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act that just happened, they're adding uh, these lighter blue bars. So I'm just gonna focus on the far right. For smaller community solar systems, you can now not only get that standard tax credit, 30% back, but you can also get uh, additional funding up to close to 60% if you ensure that there's domestic content in the products, if you're uh, enrolling LMI customers, and if you're located in an LMI location. And tonight we won't get into the definitions of all those, but there's lots of opportunity in New York City to capture these larger benefits you layer on the state's benefits and you're starting to see a pretty significant deal, 80% off the price of solar. With that, community solar comes actual bill savings for those who subscribe. So I don't have a slide about it, but I think that was for brevity's sake, but let me just quickly describe, I think we're out of time, but let me quickly describe what we're doing with this analysis. So. We're working very closely with other city agency partners, including DCAS, who right now develops uh, lots of solar on, especially schools. They're putting lots of uh, rooftop solar on their buildings, but we'd, we'd like to broach a conversation about whether or not the city could be in a position where it could build community solar and maybe take some minority portion of that actual uh, solar energy for itself, and then uh, provide access to uh, low-income customers to participate and purchase um, a share of that community solar project. And ultimately what that comes with is all sorts of guarantees of bill savings and uh, opportunities to be a part of this transition without necessarily having to have the capital to deploy. And the reason why the city could be a great partner in this is not only they have access to these higher incentives, but they're the landowner, they have lots of space. So I'm gonna stop there and answer some questions. Are the one gigawatt solar and 500 megawatt storage goals city owned or any projects located in New York City? Uh, those are both any projects located in New York City. So I'll repeat that. Sorry if I mumbled it. Are the one gigawatt goal and 500 megawatt storage goals of the city city owned or any projects located? So the ones that I referenced are, are uh, citywide goals, not just city owned. The city does have a goal of 100 megawatts of solar on its own properties, on its own rooftops. And then we're contemplating as part of a lot of the research we're doing, thinking about whether it's appropriate for the city to look at a goal for storage. Am I at time? Okay, let me just, I hate to cut any of these off. How can New York City residents benefit from community solar? I, I think I touched on that a little bit, but really uh, you can participate in community solar today. There are 
developers who build community solar projects and they'll subscribe you and you have access to all those incentives today. What we want to see is a lot more community solar. And we think one way of doing that is having the city really uh, get into this game and actually uh, go out and use its real estate to either attract developers to build or build itself. Am I out of time? Pick me up. All right, sorry for cutting you short, Zach, but we are um, going to give you a little break and uh, we're going to go into breakout sessions. So we'll be splitting into different groups. Um, when, when you came in, you should have received a little star. That star has a color. You either have red, blue, yellow, or green. And so if you're in the red group, you are in the back left. Um, and then if you're in the blue group, you're in the back right. If you're in the yellow group, you're in the um, the left uh, up here. And then if you're in the green group, you're on the right over here. And so what we really do want to do during this time is to let you speak with one another, share your energy concerns with us. And um, based on what you heard today, uh, what, you know, what actions you would like to see us take. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from the breakout groups. I know we're still in the same room, but um, I'd like to welcome a volunteer from the yellow group to share what was discussed in the group. Me, right? Yes. <laughs> hey everyone. Um, my name is LJ. I uh, work at WEACT for environmental justice. I was part of the yellow group. And some of the things that we talked about for the first question and some of the concerns uh, that people had, um, one of them was talk about smaller buildings and complying with things like local law 97. Um, how, do we, how do we incentivize that? Where do we get the money to do that? Um, how do we get landlords to actually comply to do that to make these, uh, our buildings cleaner? Um, also, one thing, another thing that was brought up was getting this information to lower uh, LMI communities, right? You know, kind of having these kind of sessions, but how do we get that to the communities who need to hear this the most, who don't get a chance to ever participate in this? They they know that so many things are happening in a city and just things happen, but they don't feel like they can actively be participating in that process. Um, someone brought up uh, the issues with NYCHA that go on and the boilers um, and kind of just NYCHA's kind of plan all together. And um, also the focus on electrical electric vehicles being more so personal vehicles in riding as opposed to the heavy, uh, the medium and heavy duty trucks and like some of our buses and things like that. Should be more of a focus on kind of talking about those uh, aspects as opposed to personal vehicles and like things like where do we charge our EVs in person when we live in a city like New York where most people actually don't uh, use a car. And then the second aspect was, what was the, I can't remember the question. Uh, uh, what kind of things do we want to see uh, action taken on? So cost, obviously, is the big one. Uh, making sure that the costs are not uh, passed on to individuals, that there's some type of protection to make sure that these things don't get too expensive for anyone. Also, prioritization of like certain communities need certain things more than others do, and that making sure that we uh, that government does that in a way that's equitable. Um, there's also a concern about indoor air quality and some of these older buildings and ventilation that doesn't, you know, they don't necessarily have. What does that look like when it comes to electrification? And then one of the final things were, uh, how do we get involved? How do we, how do we move these proposals uh, forward? How do we move these plans and these uh, reports and things that we want to see done? How do we actually get involved as individuals to kind of push those forward? Cool. All right, thank you so much. Um, and that was a great recap of what was discussed. And just in the interest of time, if the following groups could, you know, mention something that maybe wasn't discussed or wasn't just shared up here. And so um, does anyone from, does anyone want to volunteer or? Can you hear me? All right, yes. My name is Calvin. I'm a student at New York City College of Technology. I study engineering. I was part of the gold group. We were the gold group. And just the top of my head, some things that we discussed were we focused mainly on buildings and the grid. One thing about the grid is, and I agree because I actually did research into it and found out that a lot of infrastructure in the United States and New York in particular, that it hasn't been upgraded. It's actually been neglected. I think that is very important as well, that um, it's up to, you know, us, the people to put, you know, 
uh, Con Edison, these other different companies that, you know, make sure that they know and understand that they have to upgrade it and that they shouldn't just do it for profit. Another thing we discussed was um, buildings and how I know one thing topic I brought up was that with buildings, I think um, the push should be to have everything decentralized. Because I know with um, the, the power structure in New York City, I don't want to say it's outdated, but it's very susceptible to, to failure. And I think decentralizing it will actually be beneficial to everybody involved. And not only that, it will actually force people to get um, have more of an understanding for themselves instead of relying on someone else that how like the power system works and that they'll be more um, responsible for like um, their particular sector. And something else that we discussed was, I can't remember the last one, but those are the two things that we mainly talked about. It was an honor to be in that group and thank you for having us. Awesome, thank you for sharing. And do we have anyone from the blue or green groups wanna come up really quickly? Can anyone hear me? I know I have the mask on. Um, I'm part of the green group and for the sake of time, really and truly, we're just concerned more about the people at the center of these conversations and that's everyday New Yorkers. So the things that come up is information, shared public knowledge, events like these are important, but it's also important to have them on the ground running in these communities that we're saying will be most impacted by some of these changes. Timeline and rollout, land use. And when we're constantly talking about equitable uses of land, how will that translate to those communities? Accessibility, impact on all levels, micro and macro level, and most importantly, who are key stakeholders in this conversation? Not only having pages of information and research, but also visual aids. If I could see a snapshot and see how all the puzzles fit, fit together, that's something that can be translated to a lot of different communities. I write for a local publication in Brooklyn, and that's probably one of my biggest takeaways from tonight is how can I create a snapshot of this in the story that not only informs them, but lets them know that they're a part of the conversations moving forward. That was something that was echoed across our group and it seems like it fits in with everyone else's. Thank you. Great, thank you for sharing. And can we have someone from our last group? Good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph, representing the Blue Stars. I work for Wildan Energy Solutions. We implement Con Ed's multifamily energy efficiency program. So the solutions can start now. So please uh, talk to me after. <laughs> for the first question, based off what we've learned from this event, what would we like to prioritize? Workforce development, low to moderate income buildings with a focus in tenant financial support and protection once these projects come into effect as well as an understanding as to when these peak hours will be happening so we can adequately prepare for those times, as well as education and awareness. I think that's very clear. There's a lot of opportunities out there, but no one knows how to find out or move on them. For the second question, how would you like to see these priorities take place in your community and how would the city government play a role? We start out with true enforcement as well as accountability because it's the higher ups that are making these decisions. So we do have to really use the stick rather than the carrot. Um, regulate, uh, I'm just reading off of a <laughs> picture right now, but um, this one I just wanna highlight more conversations like this, as well as, yeah, more workforce development. We need people to actually do this work. So you can read it over there too, but anyways, thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for participating and sharing your feedback. It's definitely very valuable and we do hear you. Um, one thing is that, you know, if there was something that we didn't get to or a question that just maybe came up right now, um, feel free to uh, fill out the survey. There is a paper survey or you can scan one of the QR codes around the room and fill out the survey there. Or if you still have note cards, you can pass one of those to us and we'll uh, and leave your contact information on there and we can get back to you that way too. But now I'll pass it back to our CBOs for a closing remark. Just want to thank you all for taking your time tonight. I know this was a long session and you all, and I'm surprised that a lot of people didn't skip out at the breakout session. So, but you know, there was a lot of thoughtful feedback that we heard here. It is a, a very, uh, you know, 
not difficult, but it's a lot of information to digest. Uh, there are some upcoming sessions that are going to be done online. So if you want to participate, that they kind of drill down in some of these areas and there will be more conversations. But, you know, it's really important to have everybody's uh, feedback so that, you know, this group can kind of inform its study and, and there will be a lot, a lot more conversations. So thank you all once again for coming tonight. Um, yes, so I will just say uh, thank you all so much for participating in our town hall this evening. Um, as we've seen from everybody who has presented and spoken so thoughtfully tonight, our communities here in New York City are intrinsically connected to the environment around us, and we need to continue creating pathways for our community members to speak about how things like climate change affects them. So participation and feedback from community is absolutely essential in making any impactful strides toward environmental justice, like the uh, energy trans transition we spent time talking about tonight. Thanks so much to the organizers for NYU to, uh, for hosting us, um, and I hope you all get home safely. Thank you.